there is a new draft uh, of the spec uh, that Nick has published this afternoon, um, which will, uh, I think Nick will take us through. Uh, and I think no, Nick has got some questions that have come up during uh, his edits and revisions that he'd like to bring to the group. Um, so we'll, we'll look, look through the latest spec. Um, I've been looking at it from the point of view of um, uh, what we, how we can create some extra documentation around it. So I've started to think about what uh, putting together some notes for implementers about um, what they should be doing. Um, really, just initially, just focusing on what the responsibilities are of the uh, of the brokers and the booking system. So I'm going to just talk through some very early thoughts around that. Uh, and maybe get some suggestions from the rest of you about how to, what other documentation uh, we can uh, produce alongside the specs, make it easy for people to um, implement. Uh, and then we can talk about how we move forward from here, how we actually get to the, the 1.0. Um, so, uh, onto the, the AP, booking API questions. I'll flip over to the latest spec. Um, so. This, uh, this is an updated document. It's at the editor's draft URL. Uh, I will send an email around to the mailing list uh, after the call so that everyone who hasn't been able to make it can at least start looking at the, the spec. The idea is, is that we're, we're pushing this out even though there is still a bit of work to be done in a few areas uh, because we want to make sure that people have uh, plenty of chance to review the detail over and above what we've gone through on these calls. Um, so I'll be asking everybody generally to um, to give feedback, uh, to suggest revisions, so that we can uh, build uh, confidence in actually publishing this as a first formal release. Um, so that, that's uh, where we are. Nick, do you want to pick up and? Yeah, that would be great. Um, so I'm, I'm and just in case Ray does join in the next kind of ten minutes. Um, there's a bit that we, I've actually already talked to Ray separately about that I wanted to bring to the group and share what we chatted about, and then uh, get get Ian's thoughts specifically on it. Um, and that is uh, kids' activity booking. Uh, so uh, you might have seen around the to mailing list there was a. Uh, um, an email from Alistair at um, Public Health England about about that. So um, a quick chat with Ray revealed that it might not be a lot of work to add that in, um, but that might just be with clarity. So I wanted to get a few other systems input, but as uh, um, we, ha we have got apologies from basically everybody today for some reason, um, uh, Ian, it, it might just be you that would be providing that guidance. Um, are you are you able to to hear and respond? If I asked you that, you... Uh, certainly I am. Providing you can hear, providing the gift of technology is working. Yes, it is incredible. Um, that's re that's really great. So um, what uh, what I'll do then is I'll just I'll just what I've I've just surfaced to the group so everyone's got the visibility of. Uh, what uh, Ray and I talked about, which was um, the, uh, the kids booking in Clarity, and and basically what what the discussion there was is that um, kids booking um, is most of the time a pretty straightforward um, uh, thing to do because you don't you don't need to take very many details for the kids for GDPR reasons. Um, you just want the forename and surname really, and then you just trust that. This is all. This is all the clarity's perspective. You just trust that if um, you booked a kid in for a, you know, a, a thing that's between eight and twelve years in, in relevance or, or whatever it is, as an age bracket, you trust that the parent has um, put their kid in the right class. You don't ask for any date of birth to verify that stuff because that's too much information. Um, is their view, and so um, the only information we would need to capture is attendee details, of uh, forename and surname. Um, so the customer which is the kind of record we have at the moment would stay the customer which is the lead booker effectively um or the, the well i guess the booker um but that might be different to the attendees and so all we then do is just allow for an attendees array to be supplied which is just an array of personal objects um where you've got forename surname in each one um and uh that just gets posted to the order as it usually would and recorded if that's useful for the people at reception to know or for other reasons to print certificates for swimming lessons or, or whatever it is. Um, 
and uh, checked against Bookwen, and Bookwen do have the same thing. So they, um, the only slight differences with Bookwen is you can add arbit. You, so you've got main Booker, and you can add arbitrary um, uh, attendees alongside that uh, the Booker. And the, with the, with Bookwen, you actually also specify for each of those if they're a child or not as a Boolean value. So is that child? Is that not? Which I guess helps them differentiate which the parent and the child is if they're printing a certificate or whatever it is they're doing. Um, so that's as far as we got basically the changes required to, for kids activities would just be um, an attendee array, which is optional with forename, surname, um, and, uh, and potentially a child flag. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts on that are Ian from, from legends perspective. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh -oh. um, he says this is not this is not simple. Well, the first thing is that uh, you know when we make a booking, we have to have a con a contact an account. Yeah, they don't have to have a username and password. We have to have an account, and I think we've already decided the account will be distinguished by an email address. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, what's the child's email address going to be? So would you be booking under the child's account rather than under the parent's account? Yes. Now we can make the, we can put the debt on the parent's account and have the attendance on the child's account, and we can link the child's account to, the, to one or more parent accounts actually, because that's the way things work these days. Um, but in general, yes, we can attend the child separately to the payment. Though I don't think that particularly matters. You know, so you know, all you care is it's paid for. Um, we do actually have um, settings which state, if, if, a child, if, if our setting says that the age range is five to 12, then I believe we will not be able to book someone in if their date of birth is not present uh, and is not within that age range. I might need to check that. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if that fits particularly well with our structure. <laughs> Ha. Um, so it's, it's just so, uh, to make sure I understand, you've got a parent-child relationship between parent and children, funnily enough. Um, we can have, yes, we can have. Just for clarity, I shouldn't say that with Raymond out here, <laughs> just for clarity, um, that's something that's only particularly used in the, uh, our sports programmes rather than class bookings and activities. But the, the relation, so what, what I mean by that is that you can create that relationship, we can create that relationship, but in terms of online, to be able to select which of your children you want to book in, that's only available for sports courses, yeah? So that's a, um, a background connection, which isn't used in classes at the moment, though, that's on our roadmap. Ah, I see, okay, that makes sense. So, um, and, and would you expect when the, the parent, as you mentioned, has the debt on their account, they're obviously the payee, um, is it the case that the parent, the invoice sits on the parent's account and then the child, uh, how does that work? In the case of uh, sports courses, yes. In the case of classes, no. You'd actually bill the child. You'd bill the child, right. Bill and pay for the child, yeah. Sure. S okay. So we... Um, I guess the potential issue there um, is, yeah, and I, I did actually have a quick chat with um, Gladstone about this, with, sorry, Gladstone, with Fusion, about Gladstone's implementation of it um, when I spoke to them a few days ago, um, as I happened to be talking about other things. And they mentioned that in Gladstone, you actually have a similar setup where you have the account of the child. You make the booking against the account. Um, but uh, it didn't seem to matter too much to them which way around it it it, it worked um, in terms of the, as an operator. Um, so do, do they do they do people care about having the name on the account and things like that with the with the kid there? Is that something that everyone needs to maintain integrity on data integrity on? We well, like I said, for for what we're talking about at the moment, you'd be booking a um, a class for the child. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's no point in bringing in and someone else pays for it, I think, in this context, because that's really, really relevant when you want to manage debt and there won't be any debt on this case. Yeah. For me, the question is, how are you going to identify that child? Yes. 
so yeah. they don't have an email address which is the primary key for mm. um the kind of person in this case they won't have any you know if you won unless you're very precocious you don't, don't have a google account yeah i know it's coming and you know it won't be long but <laughs> <laughs> on your on your birth certificate right assigned ids yeah um so okay that makes sense so actually the one account the uh, so the simple case is that you, you submit the child is, is the account. Um, so for that to work then, if we had the attendee, so trying to mash the two models together, if we had the attendee um, provided and we use that to create the account rather than the, the customer, um, customer object as it were, then your customer object could still contain the, the person who's paying. Um, so for consistency, so the customer object can be the, the parent, and it sounds like in Legend and Gladstone's case, you might not record the child. Sorry, you might not record the parent. You might just put the child's account with, and the payment goes through and, and the, the parent information is ignored or maybe it's added to the notes field or something. Um, yeah, I suppose the challenge with this is that, I suppose sorry, the challenge ahead. with this is that you could, is that Ray? I think Lee was trying to say something. No, it's kept oh, going. okay. Yeah. No, I, I said go ahead. I was going to interject, but fine. There's there's quite a lot of latency on this call actually. So it's about four seconds. I can see hear you talk and then your mouth moves about four seconds later. It's weird. <laughs> right. Um, the okay. So what I'm saying here is that the the challenge is that if I want to book myself in, Ian at Legendware, um, then I've got to record that. If I then want to book my child in. I've got to put down Jamie at whatever Gmail. And if I want to put another child in, it's blah, 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 blah. So um, unless we have an explicit relationship where I can, if you like, log in and then pick from my children, you'd have to actually log in effectively three times to make a book of yourself and your two children, which I guess is what we want to try and avoid. Mm. But yes, I see, because you can't um, book the child from the parent, as it were. I think the other challenge we've got is deduplication. Because if we just put, you know, it has to have, an, the child has to have an account. However we, however we key it, the child has to have an account. So um, if I come in and then the wife comes in a bit later and puts in Jamie Downs, yeah, how are we going to deduplicate that? Because there's no unique identifier for that, that child. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we could return a unit. So, you know, we could, we could set things up so that when I, as Ian Downs, log in and say, oh, I'd like to add a child. And by the way, it's, it's Jamie. Yeah. That creates that link record. That creates the account. For ignoring how we manage the, um, the identification of that person. Um, I don't know how we do that, but that doesn't matter. Um, if then Madam came in and she wanted to book something for Jamie, it will be a different account. I can't see any easy way of doing that within the, the within the scope of the booking API as it stands at the moment. You know, I think to extend, to extend the scope there would be ridiculous at this point in time. Yeah, we're talking about linking parents together for the same child through different accounts, which agrees that sounds... something like that. Yes, yes. Yeah. We've got ways of doing it, but I think it's our scope. Yeah. Well, um, well, particularly as the whole like, member accounts is not in the spec anyway. Um, so. Yeah. So this is more about. Well, there is, like, there's, there's a concept of an account holder because yeah. customer is an account holder. Uh, well, it's just customer. It doesn't say anything about whether you're holding an account or not. Um, so I suppose that's it. It's mapping the customer. As at the moment, the, the implementation in Legend sounds like there's mapping between customer and account. But as you say, that's not necessarily. Um, uh, so, but does it? So I, I guess it does. It matter. Uh, so, so let's say for the MVP, so we, we just, as you say, duplicate, have kids linked to the parent um, and that all it does is, so the customer is still the parent record, that's fully detailed with the email address and you can key against that, find the parent, find Ian, and then it, it books against um, Jamie uh, based on the relationship there. And I, I don't, I, like you say, it's going to be difficult to key up anything except the name really, unless you ask for date of birth. 
uh, but then you might have two twins and then um, you'd have to do something to combine them. So I suppose that there's, that there's a risk that might just generate a new account as it were for each. Um, unless we can override why, why is it. If, 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 in, if in this system, uh, children have accounts, then why isn't the customer the child? The customer doesn't have an email. Well, the, the child doesn't have an email address. But, but I, I thought it said that the unique key in the system was the email address. So either they all do or they all don't. Oh, I think this is because Legend doesn't have a unique key as email address um, in normally. It's only for this, uh, this booking API that we're using email address as the key. Ordinarily, you can have multiple email addresses in the family, all with different names. Uh, is that right, Ian? Yeah, I mean, within online services, the um, our web applications, the uh, email is the key. But if people don't have a, a, an online account, then we don't have a primary key as such. It's the member number or something like that. Um, so the emails can be random or not there or anything. So what we need to do is say, ah, oh, it's um, uh, it's an ODI account, and therefore we will make sure that the email address is the primary key, effectively, somehow. Mm -hmm. But I don't think in the API we want to be starting to associate parent child, explicit parent child relationships or any kind of relationships between adults and minors so that shouldn't be that shouldn't be in the data structure anywhere yeah i guess i was thinking if we still if we went with kind of book when and clarities um you have a customer and then you have an attendee uh kind of um att attendee structure then it's quite simple and then you could infer that those are children that they're relation related oh but i see what you're saying that they might, might not be Sorry, it would always be children, would they? Because I might book four places on a course. It could be my three other friends. Yeah, so your parent-child relationships can't be inferred unless we use the, the is child flag, which um, Book When has. So they have an is child flag on each of the um, attendees. But but that's that that is exerting that relationship. I've just that comes another piece of personal information that we're collecting. Yes. And is that actually required to fulfill the service? I'm not sure that it is. Nope. Mm -hmm. what's, what's what's the use case for um, collecting any information about the child at all? Well, it's it's mainly the certificates that, or and knowing the children in the register when they turn up and things like that. Uh, that's 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 the what. Uh, uh, so it's like from Ray, the conversation with Ray, that's mainly why they capture that information. But like I said, it's literally first name, surname, there's nothing else. Certainly not data there. Are we, are we just allowing scope creep to happen here? Well, this is the question. If it's something that's simple, I suppose, as you saw in Alice's email, obviously the scale of the opportunity there is large, but, and, and I know that the second iteration of this API might not happen for a while. So this is kind of saying whether Change for Life can uh, use this is I suppose what it is um, uh, and I suppose if we've given it some discussion and it's it's hard or, or maybe there's a very small amount of work we can do to so so, so, so just as a proposition before we move on um because I, I think you're right we could spend a lot of time on this um it, if we had an attendee uh, array would it be possible to permit within legend for example uh adults to book on to children's classes um but supply a um uh, the child's uh, name in the booking description or the, you know some free text field that you have there uh, so effectively I think I think the first challenge is that every single booking is a separate booking so you can't book four people into one place you book four places oh, in so having an array of attendees wouldn't work because you'd need to say um, uh, booking one child one, booking you know, customer one child one, booking two customer one child two, booking three customer one child three. So my counting is getting a bit skewed up there. Um, the other thing is, as I, as I was saying to begin with, that if we've got an age range specified for the activity, then we would need to check the the date of birth. So if we can report the age range back, then if that attendee didn't have a date of birth. Or the date of birth was out of scope, then we wouldn't be able to book them in. So 
Um, I mean, I need to look into that quite a bit more because I think there's, there's, there's a lot of under the hood stuff I need to think about there. Um, I was thinking if there was a way of overriding that so that you don't have those constraints for this case and like make it as, as simple as possible so we don't we don't even check date of birth it, it just literally books it under the adults account well then we'd have to fit we'd have to undo that in the rest of the ledger i, I don't mm. i can look into this but i don't think it's trivial i think there's a lot of challenges here okay and i, I don't i think there's a lot of challenges here um, that's good to know well thank you that's that's really really helpful um, and it may well I don't think it is. <laughs> well, it's, it, it, I suppose it depends how you find it helpful, isn't it? <laughs> more information to, to make decisions, yes. And it's, a, it's a shame that it's complicated, uh, but yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. So that's really good. So we'll, um, sounds like there's a couple of, of things here. So, you know, obviously there's the clarity in the book when route, which is the booking itself has an attendee list to your point on, you know, it's, they're not assigned by, you know, you might have, you might book uh, two, uh, two spots in a class in, in one line item and the next line item might be one spot in a class, but because it's at the booking level, at the order level, uh, the, the attendees, it doesn't say who's in which, um, and that, that information is not captured anywhere. So for that simple case, obviously that's, there's a straightforward route here, but where you need to associate those things, um, that ad becomes even more complicated because for every, at the moment, the structure we have in the API here, um, you have a number of bookings. So you can book seven Zumba places and you would have to then have an array of seven in that um, order item that matched uh, seven attendees for the seven places. Um, and then if it's the same attendee, you'd have to duplicate that information, uh, which is all very complicated. So, um, okay, so should we move on to next questions? Uh, so hopefully the next one's a bit easier because we've so, done yeah, So just before we do move on, it might be worth capturing um, in GitHub somewhere, some some of the things that are possible without changes to the spec. So, for example, it feels to me like booking free places um, where you don't necessarily, you know, even need to be paying or need to know details of attendees. That that is still possible. So, so we can just start to scope out which things might not be available for mm. child bookings, rather than it being a black or white. This is not supported that's a good idea so we, we keep um if, if we can some minimal functionality in there so the other thing i'd like to say is it would be useful to get some use cases for this um the email from alistair is a a vision statement <laughs> uh, and really the the meat of it is book children's activities but what does that mean what activities you know what are the genuine constraints you need to, have to put in uh, it may be enough to um just say have some way of marking the activities of children's activity or it outside the current age restrictions yeah and not book it not build it in as a as a as, a, as a, an age restricted activity and yes it may well be possible to just put the the uh, the first or second name of the uh, of the attendee um with you know and bypass that check by bypassing the actual checks within the within systems and not putting the age against it um, there's, there's ways we might be able to do that, but uh, mm -hmm. I think what really would help is what are the use cases? Because it's we're kind of inventing them at the moment. A little yes, bit. absolutely. Okay, that sounds good. It's something I imagine. Um, so, so um, uh, Stephen Winfield at GLL said, if there's anything that he can help with for the booking stuff, to let him know. And this sounds like a great thing that we can put to GLL. What kids' activities do you have that you would like change for life to book? Um, same question for. Uh, for other operators and other other providers, um, I know Bookwen's got some already, but they, it's easy to to reference. But yeah, you're right. So sounds like that's a good question. I think there's another question here about holding up the spec for this, and I, I can see that there's there's basically if this isn't a simple answer, we might not want to invest in weeks and, and weeks. Uh, I was kind of hoping it would just be a simple array that we could add and crack on, <laughs> but it's uh, that might be unlikely. But it, maybe yeah. if we can get some use cases in the next week. And if there's something that looks like it's obvious, we can include it in the, in, 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 in the spec. But if it's going to be really complicated, and, um, then maybe uh, we have to push it. That makes sense. OK. OK. Um, what, what was next on your list? Um, OK, so uh, yeah, next list on the list of questions is uh, 
go back to the question list. So we've got, um, okay, this is a slightly easy question because we covered a lot of it last time. So if you scroll down the document on the left to uh, booking cancellations, uh, 9.3, 9.3, uh, yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, if we go to 9.2, I will show you the changes we made based on the last conversation. If you remember last week, there was strong pushback from everybody about um, the idea of doing anything with um, amending orders. I think that was just generally a very bad and complicated idea uh, for this version. So um, the, what this is talking about as a, as a process, just to talk you through, is, is just to cancel. All you do is you post a order quote with the order status of cancelled. Um, so you can't do any amendments, it's full cancellation. Um, and then it will come, come back with an amount um, that is the, the new value of the transaction. Um, and there's a question about cancellation fees, which um, I have in there in a sec. And then, then we would issue the refund, um, maybe not a full refund if there was a cancellation fee, again, question to ask. And then you would submit um, the order to confirm that that is 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 done uh, after the the refund, and then that's it. And then the the and then it's it's uh, that is now um, records complete. You can't make any further amendments. It's it's effectively a full full cancellation that has been processed. Um, so my question is, and it's it seems common to that uh, there are um, cancellation fees for um, things that aren't that you want to cancel as a user. Um, and you may be penalized for either because the rules say that it's a certain number of hours before whatever the booking system has as a constraint around cancellation uh, for non-members or for um, uh, if you can even cancel at all. And so is it going to be, because we can, we can include that in here and just have the final value being, you know, that including that, trans that cancellation fee, but I don't know if that's, you know, what you think about that. Um, sorry, just to, just to uh, back up a little bit. So what, the requirement I'm running with is that you can, the customer can cancel an order. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've got elsewhere that the, uh, there may be limits on about how uh, close to an event that they can do cancellation. So there might be some constraints on that. Uh, and then separately, you've noted that there may be some cancellation fees. So you might not get a full refund. Okay, but that but the whole order is cancelled or yep. not. Completely okay. cancelled or not, and so, the order status of cancelled would then represent that. So the, the mechanism you're describing here is submitting another order quote, etc. Um, I thought we were retaining the original bit of the API that there would be order URLs, in which case I was expecting to see a post or a delete or something to that order specific order URL rather than trying to reuse the existing um, mechanism. So the order quote is is a um, it's a post. Uh, it's just to the quote, and the reason there's a quote is you get the quote first, and then depending on that amount, you'll need to refund accordingly, and then you complete it. So it's the same two phase um, as as exists. Um, the reason it's not a delete in terms of rest is that you're not deleting to the last calls point on voiding things. We're not actually deleting the quote. No, sorry, we're not deleting the order. We are cancelling the order, which doesn't invalidate it it just um it puts it into a different state uh, okay okay um but it, it, it's just not clear to me that you're interacting with uh, an order url endpoint here okay yeah that um, makes sense so make to me make, make that clear but, but, but it, like semantic again so like kind of semantics of like the what um what's being changed is what again why wouldn't you use a patch for example or a post back the current um, state of the resource rather than an order quote because an order quote as I understood it was a structure that was being passed around that two-phase commit and the end result was an order yes. so I was expected to see I'd be submitting an or a revised order with the status of cancelled not an order quote so the re so you do submit a revised order that's step four submitting a revised order with the status of cancelled um, sorry it wasn't clear so, um, so why do you need two phases for this piece because if you generate a cancellation fee or any anything that if there's any issue with it basically at all, so it's not cancelable because it's too close, um, is a cancellation fee. Um, there's a number of things that could be the case. 
the order quote will bottom that out. So the order quote might fail or it might return, you know, everything except the cancellation fee um, needs to be refunded or whatever the state will be basically when the order is completed. So that, that gives you the kind of preview of what will happen if you commit this change. You then make the refund accordingly if you need to um, and then um, commit the change. So the assumption is that the um, the refund will happen in in the process in this transaction. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's step step three: uh, issuing a refund if appropriate. So I thought, if I remember, when we discussed cancellations before, there were some questions around whether can refunds and cancellations could, ha could happen interactively. So I'm, I'm just, I suppose I'm raising that again. That is still an, do you think that's still an issue. Well, so maybe before we get into that, it might be worth just see, asking Ian if um, this is even if cancellation fees is even a thing, and what the process is in Legend to cancel. Uh, in in general, in general, we wouldn't charge a cancellation fee if it's cancelled in time. So what would what we there's there's two sorts of cancellations fee, yeah. Um, one is that we um, don't refund. So there's, there's a cancellation cutoff that's, let's say, a day before the event. Uh, if they cancel before that, then they get a full credit, full refund. If they cancel after that, um, then they will get a no, ref no refund or a partial refund. Um, in the cases where, and I know it's not germane to the immediate requirement, in the cases where they had a discount against that um, class, either they'll have to pay the full price or the residual, so if they've got 40% off, then they've got to pay the 40%. That gets billed to them. But bear in mind that's an extra charge. Yeah. Or alternatively, they'll be charged a fee for cancelling. Yeah. Now, I think that what we'll be looking at in this case, just not allowing them to book after that cancellation cut off. So there'll be a choice of either refunding the entire amount of money or refunding nothing. Anything else I think is beyond the scope of version one because it's messy. And you've got to try and get more money out of the customer to cancel something, which just isn't going to happen. No, it's more. It was more of a forty-pound um, uh, football pitch got cancelled or something. And would you would you retain ten pounds as a cancellation fee? I guess was the question. But yes, you you might do. I mean, but what I, I what I guess I'm saying is that our system will allow you to charge extra for oh, cancellation, actually, which we don't want to do. No, there's no way your uh, the the, <laughs> um, the seller would be able to capture that. No, or, or yeah, um, unless they were, there was any other benefit in them doing it, why would they um, pay more? So. Okay. Uh, I'm a little bit confused about the, uh, I've just read this very briefly, and you issue an order quote with status of cancelled, which should probably be cancellation request, because cancelled sounds like it's cancelled. Yep. If there was such a thing. Um, then returns a uh, the uh, transaction raise got any payment so um, that was effectively saying there's these five items that you booked in this order and you're going to have to pay five pounds for that one or we'll refund five pounds for that one nothing for that one ten pounds for that one yeah um, and then after once you've shown that to the customer and taken the money you then kind of push that back in with the same transaction array saying um, it, this has been credited, that hasn't been credited, this has been credited effectively. Okay. Um, what do we do when one of the items can't be cancelled or the events happen? Do we just tell them that can't be cancelled? And how do we indicate it can't be cancelled if all we've got is an array of prices that they will, or credits they will have to get? Mm. Well, is that part of that semantics? Is it that uh, everything can be cancelled, you just might not get a refund? But that's confusing, isn't it? Because if it actually can't be cancelled, I think it's a distinction between something that we will not, we cannot cancel and something you can cancel, but you don't get any money back. Right, so if it's not... Okay. 
because we would actually like people to be able to cancel when they don't get money back so we at least make space for someone else to buy things from it um, and there's also the semantics of I've got an order which has got classes across two weeks um, there was 10 classes I've actually attended five of them because it's midweek or Saturday and I want to cancel next week's but the semantics here is saying I want to cancel the whole order and I just think we need to be clear about how that the fact that only half can be cancelled because in the past because I think that's different to I can't cancel them as well I may be being picky about this but <laughs> no, 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 no those are those are all good all good things um, so I, I think this needs to look we need to take that away and revise this a bit I I, I can see that there is a um, multi the potential for multi-step here uh because um you do want to say i want to cancel this and get a response that will indicate um which things have actually been cancelled and the confirm the totals that should be refunded but i and i would also expect um that from a booking system point of view you might want to have a confirmation when those refunds have actually taken place so that as we've done elsewhere in the API both sides have clarity about who's attending and how much has been paid and in this case how much has been refunded so there's actually a couple of states that I think an order can move through to you know being cancelled and refunded um, but I think it would be clearer to do that with uh, as a more kind of restful interaction to rather than using order quotes I think updating an order and having an explicit set of uh, refund totals rather than changing the, um, the existing totals might be might be clearer because so then I, it, yeah, yeah I, I haven't explained it very well because step four does do that it, it does the, it is the confirmation so currently no state change happens to the booking system at all until until four uh, all you're doing is just checking if it's all possible and if it's all possible you issue the refund and then confirm it in number in step four I suppose there's two there's two different there's, there's two different um, things to pick up here. There's the do, how do we do it in a restful way, and you know is that post is it deletes is it whatever. There's lots of different approaches there, and then there's what is what are the steps in the process. So is it is it check and submit? Is it uh, change the state twice? Is it you know what's the um, so the idea here was minimal state changes. So absolutely nothing changes until the point where it's cancelled and refunded in one go, and that's either all done or it's not done. And there's no halfway situation um, that is possible in the in the call and order but it, but to give the um, it, the broker the some flexibility about when refunds are processed which might not be synchronous with when the cancellations happen you know they might choose to do those refunds separately um, that we shouldn't dictate or presume a certain a particular flow so that sounds like a good another requirement so that requirement says that the yeah that the refunds don't happen with the so you can cancel something and refund it separately as two well, separate things. I, I thought that had been mentioned previously when we were talking about notifications that um somebody might not because when we were talking about having more real-time webhook based notifications i think somebody made a the point then that actually the re, um the money wouldn't necessarily be returned to somebody uh, Immediately, it might be a separate payment processing flow, particularly if it might be um, annually. How people are handling it financially. Okay. I think we certainly need a two step process because um, only the um, provider, like ourselves, can know if it can be cancelled. Who knows what's happened since then? So we, we might have cancelled. We might have cancelled the class until the um, the broker and then the seller. Uh, but then, if things don't go perfectly well, then the, the purchaser may decide to cancel that order. But the cash is already cancelled. So we need to have that stage of checking. And then absolutely, definitely, if the customer decides they want to actually cancel, we need to know what will be or has been refunded. Uh, so we can, well, for reporting purposes and also so that we can make sure we get the right amount of commission from the, um, or payment from the, the seller. Mm. So I think the two stages is essential. I don't really care about the, the, um, the, the restful semantics. That's, that's, that's not hugely important. It is important, of course it is, don't get me wrong. Um, 
but yes, I agree that the refund is not necessarily going to be synchronous with that. So would you want to have a, uh, a separate um, the ability to separate it, the cancelled state from the refunded state? So you could you could have it cancelled but not refunded yet, and then cancelled and refunded as a separate thing. I don't think we wouldn't do it that way. Um, we would see it as a request for cancellation information. Can I cancel these things? What am I going to get back from it? And then I do it. Yeah, we wouldn't actually cancel them and then charge a refund. I don't think we could do that. It just isn't where the system works. Um, but I think the basic, I, I like the idea of, I'd like to cancel this order, what's going to happen? And then, okay, go and do it. Okay, uh, yeah, that, that, that's good. So, so it sounds like the question left is, so yeah, so it sounds like we're all agreed on the two phase commit approach, you preview then do. A uh, question about whether the do bit is uh, is further broken down into um, do the cancel, do the refund, or as you're saying uh, in legend, it would just be uh, just do it all together or not. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know why you separate that actually, because the, I don't know why you separate the uh, credit, the, notifying the credits with doing the, the, the cancellation because you couldn't have one without the other. Um, well, I think we kind of have it in the other bit of the API already. Uh, so I'm trying to like get it consistent because the broker refund requested status change is the, um, so not broker refund. When the booking system updates the, to say uh, something has been canceled from the booking system side, there's basically uh, entries into the, uh, RPD, RPD feed for the broker to say this has been cancelled um, so they'll have to do, perform the refund separate to the cancellation but there will need to be an update I think we've actually got it documented that there is a subsequent update back to the booking system to say that that has been actioned so I think there's just two things need to be consistent that what's different is where the, the initial trigger for the cancellation Okay, uh, we haven't got to that bit yet. That, that's um, uh, it's a separate thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, yeah. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> so, so shall we move on then? In that, on that basis, sounds like the, it's we've agreed on the requirements basically for this piece, and it sounds like that's not a requirement. However, consistency overall might make it one. So, we need to talk about that when we talk about it uh, next. So um, can I just, just 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 as a but I don't think we could do that. I don't think we could actually um, do a cancellation and later raise credits or recall the credits. Not not at all easily. Yeah, it's okay. at the wrong level of the system. Just for information. That sounds okay. That's really good to know. So it sounds like there's a strong preference for this this piece to just do it to do it at the same time in a transaction. Uh, and uh, well, the other thing is if you know you look at it look at its integrity. Um, if they issue two calls and one says cancel and the next says credit and something breaks in between, then it gets very messy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or worse, vice versa. Yes. Uh, and then we'll have to recover it as well. Um, that makes sense. So it's something we definitely need to think about for, for, for the um, refund requested. It might be worth, um, I was going to... Um, so ask about cancellation fees next, but I mean, maybe it's worth us just moving to that quickly if, as we're talking about it um, for the next seven minutes. So um, if, you, if you go to uh, 9.5.1 there, um, Lee, that's the, re the we did We did briefly touch on this um, last call, but I imagine it might have been Ian just after you popped off, I, I'm, I think. Um, so Yeah, afraid so. That's okay, and, and it will happen again in seven minutes, so we'll try and do it this, <laughs> this time. Uh, in so, uh, th basically, this, this is just a feed of, of um, so the, the, the requirement here is, um, if for some reason there's a flood or whatever it is that happens, and a provider is, needs to do a cancellation, mass cancellation, potentially, of a bunch of things, um, and if they do that, then, then the um, customers are due a refund on the basis that the event didn't go ahead. Um, or, or can't go ahead or whatever that situation is. And so because the payments are taken separately, the booking system will need to issue a request to um, the broker to make that, uh, to, 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 to do that refund. Um, and um, 
you had talked about webhooks before, but um, there's they're problematic um, for all the reasons we we discussed last time in terms of what happens if you miss them and what are the what are the um, uh, there's various scenarios there. Um, so we we come on to talk about the feed as an approach where they can just be processed later on. So um, the uh, broker would be checking this feed, and if there's any cancellation requests that come in, sorry, any any refund requests that come in, they process those refunds and then um, notify back to say, yes, I've processed this one, this one, this one. Um, Just for clarity, there's a, there's a disconnect between the first paragraph and the second paragraph. So how do you find the order items? I mean, I know how you find the order items, but you've got a class that's one of the elements in the order. Um, would Are you retaining the, I suppose you would be in the, 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 the broker, retaining the actual identifier for that class so you can look it up? And then from that work out what the order was, and then then do the next bit. So I think there's a there's a it's, it's it's probably obvious, but I think it'd be good to make it explicit as to how the order is retrieved, uh, and to make sure for that matter that the broker stores the details of the order. Otherwise, he can't um, find the order from the the, the uh, activity ID or whatever it's called. Yeah, that was, that was one of the things I'd listed in my things that brokers should be doing. So well, I suppose the good thing about this being an RPD feed, incidentally, is if the broker wants to synchronize state using it, they could just go back to the beginning of the feed and get all the bookings, um, the, all the all the orders um, that are being that have been made on behalf of that broker, um, to, in order to to make sure that they. So it's effectively this is providing them that window into fully synchronizing the information um, instead of. When you say when you say orders, I'm confused by that because the order is not part of the uh, the feed, is it? So this is a separate, so the idea here is this is a separate feed that's a private feed that's authenticated. Um, and oh, okay, that wasn't clear. Sorry, yes, that was, um, that's a key point that I definitely skipped over. So the, uh, this, all the sections okay. in the context of, yes, sorry, that feed. Um, and the idea is that any, any so, so the idea with this feed is anytime anything happens, any bookings are made or, um, or cancelled, um, that there's a, a, the order is posted to the feed as an update in the normal way. Obviously, this this is going to have much lower um, frequency of of polling compared to the other feeds that we've got. No problems. Yeah, got that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, and the reason for that is that if we used a webhook based approach, we would have to do have a fallback anyway, so that people can retrieve the state. And so, rather than implementing two approaches, we we come to just why well, we implement just the one, um, and then. Therefore, uh, that'll be the simplest uh, route. The trouble with this is, though, of course, it is asynchronous. So you're getting that, you're polling for that information, you're processing it, and you're posting back that you've completed it. So to, to Lee's previous point, there is the potential that you could cancel a bunch of stuff on the provider side because of some uh, incident. Uh, well, the instructor's ill, cancel the class, the class is cancelled, 15 attendees. Uh, with all those orders need to then be um, uh, refunded. So these requests come through to the feed and then they would be processed one at a time, which put, puts the, the order in that. When, when the class is cancelled and you've got 15 attendees, uh, half of whom have come through third parties, uh, there will then be a period of time between the order being cancelled and those third parties processing the refund um, that puts those orders into a state of... Um, Inconsistency, I guess. Could I, sorry, just uh, could I suggest a uh, the uh, the broker should inform the customer on receiving a cancelled order. I don't know if that's that should be part of the spec. It should certainly be part of the operational processing. Yes. Yes, uh, of course. Yeah, because that that's the notification approach. Uh, I think the other thing that is, uh, which I've just kind of realised now, is that there's there's some uh, differences here in that uh, we are saying that a broker can only cancel a whole order, where you're saying a booking system can actually uh, mm. cancel part of an order. Yeah, and I don't think it, it would probably not be fair to force the full cancellation because if, if someone's ill and then your entire schedule gets cancelled for the next month because it was all in one order, yeah, pretty disappointed. But that means that the what um, 
the data structure for order needs to be clear about which items are currently or the state for each individual items and how much is due to be refunded for those items. Uh, and I think trying to keep that consistent, those sets of states and how we communicate refund amounts should be, should be a, a, as consistent as possible, regardless of where the original kind of cancellation was triggered. It's, it's a, yeah, it's unfortunate because we, I think we, we said before it would be complicated to um, do partial refunds, but obviously that's exactly what this calls for. Um, yeah, well, we've, we have also, somewhere along the lines, decided that, okay, it was, it, we're more or less most of the way there, let's support multiple, or, multiple item orders. Um, this is just, an, this is another case where it's adding a little bit of, maybe not complexity, but sort of disconnect between different bits of the API. Yes. Um, I mean, the other option, of course, is that we just don't permit provider side cancellations and refunds. But I, I don't know if that's an option, really. I don't think anything to do. Well, we're not doing the refund, but we do need to recall the fact that the refund has been made. Yeah. yeah. Again, financial reporting and actually checking you've got the right payment from the customer. Uh, with a broker. Okay, so let me take would this it be away. Possible to have the, the, would it be possible to have um, a distinct status for an order, which is a refund notification or a credit notification or whatever, as opposed to a cancellation? That would clarify mm. the semantics, I think. Yes, because you're you're not actually you're not actually cancelling it until you're just saying to the broker to cancel it, and then they can cancel it using the normal process. That's really good um, and simplifies everything a lot because you can just use the standard stuff. Uh, but it does mean that the standard stuff needs to support partial uh, cancellation. So uh, that's, that's, that's close to what I think my original suggestion of actually of, 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 of transmitting a notification object with a, a, a state that you want to trans move to rather than the orders. Oh, I see. Oh, I was, I was, I was, I heard that as um, the order actually moves into that notification state and sits there in that, in that, in that state. But, um, what Gentlemen, I'm afraid that the time has come. I'm about to turn to a pumpkin. I'm ever so sorry. Um, no problem. Thank you so much, Ian, and uh, appreciate that pleasure. input as always. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get back on the next call and hopefully we'll have some answers to the questions. <laughs> Super. <laughs> All right. Cheerio. Okay, see you soon. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm dropping oh. off as well, afraid, guys. Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll think, catch up soon. Yeah, I've got a shoe as well. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I think we're we'll <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's useful discussions. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. All right, thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.